Well, I certainly wasn't looking forward to a day where we would have to put our audience to sleep by talking about newspaper comic strips and the guy who wrote one of the biggest, longest-running strips ever, and also his slow but consistent descent into being an isolated, conservative whack job. But over the weekend, Dilbert creator Scott Adams finally went a bit too far with his brand of conservatism when he advocated for the separation of races in America. Just a bit too far. Uh, <laughs> I guess a smidge too far, yeah. So we'll tell you exactly what he said in a few seconds, but we're also working against a content algorithm with no rationality when it comes to reporting the news versus actively spouting off overt racism, uh, even if it's attributed to someone else. Yep, we love it. Don't mm -hmm. we, folks? But yeah, you might be wondering, the Dilbert guy said what? The Dilbert guy? The guy who made a cartoon centered entirely around office workers' banal interactions with each other in management? That guy's a nut job? Oh, oh. my sweet summer child. Dear viewer, this has been happening for uh, quite some time, yeah. actually. Uh, it's like if you have it's if you somehow hadn't seen any of Russell Brand's content in like, I don't know, half a decade or so, and you're now checking in on him, and you're somehow surprised to see him rubbing elbows with the likes of Donald Trump Jr. and Kimberly Guilfoyle. Wait, that also happened? Yes. It that's... was a gradual uh, <laughs> sort of thing. And uh, yeah, it would seem pretty jarring uh -huh. if you were just tuning in <laughs> yeah. all of a sudden. But yeah, Scott Adams has been pretty vocal about his descent into conservative hell for quite some time now, with the big shift in tone aligning with the rise of Donald Trump as a political figure. Adams went head over heels for Trump and has been parroting and in a lot of cases creating far right talking points ever since. Hell, three years ago, he said that the Dilbert TV show was canceled back in 1999 because he was white, <laughs> despite being quoted in the years after the show's cancellation, uh, saying that it was the result of low viewership and poor management. Nope, they canceled the show because it was too white. Also, yeah, it's like the poor management thing. It's like, okay, well, use that in the Dilbert comic. That's what you're good at, yeah. talking about bad management. It's going to be great for the comic strip. It is especially weird. Like, Dilbert is a very, like, you could almost, uh, you know, say, like, pro-labor uh, strip yeah. in some ways. It could be interpreted that way. Clearly, <laughs> that would be a subjective interpretation, but yeah. like, well, it also like it's, 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 it's always all it was always a comic strip about how like CEOs are fucking idiots. Yes, <laughs> and like, it's just it's weird just dealing with those on office interactions. But again, it's like this guy obviously, well, I don't know, but seems to be clearly a completely different person than the Scott Adams of the 1990s. Or maybe that was always there, and it just kind of got. Uh, uh, you know, ratcheted up a bit. I, but... I believe this can all be uh, explained in large part uh, with the same reason that you can explain a lot of these sorts of things. Um, I believe Scott Adams has had multiple expensive divorces. Okay, well that in might the, be in yeah. the past like decade or so. I think that probably uh, yeah. Well, as divorce energy. As of the time that we filmed this episode, there is still no word on whether or not his first foray into the food business, the Dill Burrito. Oh shit! Was ultimately not successful for the same reasons. It, I mean. It probably was. What is this white man burrito? This fucking sucks. Why is Dilbert from the newspaper? Why is Dilbert from the newspaper trying to sell me a burrito? Yeah, he might have something there with this one. But uh, while looking into the Dil burrito, which is a complete tangent, it was just interesting. We did find a few of the same trends consistent with his particular brand of victim of it. Most notably that uh, he claimed a mysterious group was secretly out to get him. In the case of the Dill Burrito, which was a vitamin-packed meatless burrito... Oh, sounds woke to me. Adams claimed that, quote, rival food makers surreptitiously sent agents into stores to bury it on the back of shelves. Yeah, I'm sure that's, that's what happened. Yeah, so politically, the dude has been all over the place. And at one point being head over heels for former President Bill Clinton, and then later describing himself as left of Bernie Sanders. It, it is a, a fact of life that uh, anytime someone says that they are to the left of Bernie Sanders, the next thing that's going to come out of their mouth is going to be some of the most, like, yeah. reactionary fucking right-wing shit you've ever heard. <laughs> by, the, by left of Bernie Sanders, they mean all the way back around. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, yes, the, the hitching his wagon to Donald Trump was a decision that uh, he would go on to say hurt him both financially and personally, saying that his number of friends had decreased by 75%. So he had uh, he had four friends, and now he's got one. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Damn. Uh, he also claimed that uh, if Joe Biden won the 2020 election, that Republicans would be hunted for sport. Uh, this, this is alongside the constant parroting of the same types of talking points that you would find on a channel like OAN. Not UPN. That's the one that kicked him off the channel. Yeah, UPN's the racist one. Uh -huh. 
So yeah, around the time Trump became president, Adams split his time between Dilbert and a new podcast venture where he was joined by a laundry list of right-wing pundits, COVID conspiracists, climate deniers, and even elected officials like Matt Gates, who also falls into all of all the previous <laughs> categories. Yeah. All that is to say, this guy's been telling you who he is for a long time, and that was all well and good for the publications who ran his comic strip because, um, well, it's... One of the longest running strips still in active publication. And this is the comic strip business, guys. Like, there's not too much to go around here. Uh, this is a, he's, he's a monument to what you can do with a newspaper and some print. Right, look at that. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a comic strip about a guy who's living through the cliches of an office job, the bosses, the co-workers, everything. It's always been generally harmless satire about something that a majority of newspaper readers can relate to. And one of those things that the general population wouldn't immediately tie to its creator because, well, he's just not really huge household name. In fact, we kind of just assumed that he licensed the Dilbert thing away a long time ago. Yeah, why would you need to write this? Yeah, <laughs> he was still sitting down at the fucking drawing desk every day, cranking uh, out a new Dilbert. It, it, admittedly, in old interviews, specifically because I, I read, because it was fascinating to me about the Dilberito, uh, that admittedly, in old interviews, just like, yeah, I don't know, I crank out these Dilbert things like first thing in the morning, and I have nothing to do with the rest of my day. Man. So he's also like the first he was notable because he was like the first comic strip artist to like just get paid like crazy money. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like he's been rich since the, the 90s. The one of the one of the things that he ended up doing was like running a restaurant. And after a few months, the restaurant was they were told to only play the Dilbert TV show on the TVs at the bar and stuff like that. Weird stuff. Anyway, yeah, recent reports indicate that he did start bringing in his more divisive viewpoints into the writing of the comic strip itself, yeah. though we wouldn't know because we're not 60 years old. We haven't intentionally bought a paper newspaper <laughs> and turned to the comic strip pages to see what Dilbert's up to in, <laughs> I don't know, I guess ever. We've yeah. never done that. <laughs> we did have a Dilbert uh, daily desk calendar at the that's, old office. That's the one thing that, that I, I keep I thinking about. I kind of enjoyed it. I was like, ah, ah. Good, uh, go. good one, Dilbert. You know what? Uh, what's Gary Larson up to? I yeah. think he brought back Farsight a while ago. And as far as I know, Gary Larson, not currently racist, although I, I don't know. Well, the good thing is... Those whether, cow tools, he never explained the cow tools. Whether or not he is or he isn't, he's keeping his mouth shut. <laughs> yeah. So. But he's still silent on those cow tools and how yeah. they're used. Cow tools. Anyways, I'm not sure how many people actually read his newspaper comics at all. I would just assume that he lived off of whatever money was coming in from those tiny little desk calendar things that everyone in every office seemed to have. I just assumed Dilbert was the male Kathy. Yeah. Oh, shit, we're losing anyone under 40 years old again with so, these references. So, guys, Kathy is a, uh, she's a, you know, a, a spinster in the age of the working woman. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, so she connects with the, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm not, I, all I know is, like, all, all my old teachers used to have Kathy strips, like, up on the board next to them. Yeah, because. I can relate. Yeah. Specifically art teachers. Oh, yeah. But anyways, that long intro was just to give you the very unsurprising backstory of Scott Adams instead of just launching into this all of the sudden shocking story. And like we said, this is all probably pretty confusing and pointless to anyone under the age of 35 or so. That might even be a bit generous. Yeah. Dilbert? Scott Adams? Huh? But yeah, a dude went mask off during a recent podcast and said that white people should stay the fuck away from black people. Something he's definitely thought for a while. Yeah, it's not really something that slips out. Uh, but also felt empowered to uh, go public with after seeing the results of a recent poll of a thousand people <laughs> put out by a traditionally conservative group. Taking it even further than the authors and contributors to the poll could have ever imagined. Uh, so here's the San Francisco Chronicle with more on this. Adams, a Bay Area resident, what? Okay, made the offensive comments on his Real Coffee with Scott Adams video show after erroneously concluding that a poll had found nearly half of all blacks are not okay with white people. He was referring to a recent Rasmussen Reports survey of a thousand American adults who were asked whether they agreed with the statement, it's okay to be white, a phrase the Anti-Defamation League has labeled as hate speech. The phrase was circulated in a trolling campaign in 2017 by members of the controversial online forum 4chan, in which flyers with the slogan were posted with originators assuming liberals would respond negatively, thereby proving they did not agree with it, according to the ADL. White supremacists, who had used the phrase long before the trolling campaign, quickly promoted it, adding their website links to flyers or combining the phrase with white supremacist language or imagery, the ADL said. According to Rasmussen, 72% of Americans agreed with the statement, including 53% of black respondents. 
22% of Americans disagreed with the statement, including 26% of black respondents. The statement being, it's okay to be white. So 76% yeah. were like, well, sure. Sure, fine, whatever. And then a, like a smaller section of that section, and yes, it's divided out yeah, uh, weirdly, probably, but in his head it's just like, well, there it is, the, all the proof you need. Yeah, and probably the percentage who has seen that phrase directly used by like open white supremacists and been like, oh, yeah, no, I know what that means. I'm referring it to That's the person who screamed whistle. it at me. Yeah, yes. that is a dog whistle, and no, I don't like it. So it, he intentionally skewed the numbers and then thinking that somehow the data from this one poll, data that he didn't even analyze correctly in the first place, would back up his actually racist tirade. The article continues, if nearly half of blacks are not okay with white people, according to this poll, not according to me, according to this poll, <laughs> uh, that's a hate group, Adam said on his show. That's a hate group, and I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I would say the best advice I could give to white people is to get the hell away from black people. It makes no sense whatsoever as a white citizen of America to try to help black citizens anymore, he said. Jesus. Uh, Adams furthered his offensive rant by saying that he escaped by living in a neighborhood with a very low black population. Um, yeah, he's definitely uh, yeah. going really fucking far with it, uh, way further than even this skewed poll would represent. Yeah, he's doing uh, he's doing race science, and like most race science, he's doing it very unscientifically. Yes. Cool. So the the rant resulted in numerous publications pulling his strip from their newspapers, which added to an already growing list of publishers who'd severed their ties with the strip after it started to blatantly reflect the more outrageous viewpoints that it shared with its real life author. Bro, this is a power vacuum in the, the comic strip page that the newspapers haven't seen in, like, a generation. What's going to come? What's going to take the place of Dilbert? I don't know if Family Circus is still in, uh, in circulation, but uh, they're going to hit it with some real white nationalism soon because it was already a pretty heavily Christian strip. Yeah, and it's in a circle for some It's in a what circle. Are you doing? What is this? Well, yeah, I like my comic strips like this, not is, like this. Is Mutt still in there? That's something that was in there as a kid. They should bring back Dick Tracy. That's the thing. Dick Tracy as written by Warren Beatty. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. All right. Anyway, it is funny to see a bunch of articles about dropping this comic strip with plenty of publishers remarking, oh, we dropped that dude a while ago for shit that wasn't even as outwardly racist as this latest rant. Yeah. <laughs> we saw this coming, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think we deserve a pat on the back. Uh, according to SF Chronicle, they dropped Dilbert last October after strips that, among other things, joked that reparations proposed for African Americans because of slavery can be claimed by underperforming office workers and that to get around efforts to diversify workplaces, straight men should pretend they are gay adding that very few readers noticed when we killed it, and we only had a handful of complaints. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we would put a decent wager on the Nobody fact. cared! We, <laughs> yeah. we got rid of this and no one said a damn thing. And yeah, like, so the, the amount of people that read the physical newspaper is already such a small fucking, uh, like, small portion of the general population, and within that, the amount of people who always make sure to check what Dilbert's up to on the comic strip. Even smaller. It's, yeah. Like, but even smaller than that are people that support Scott Adams for his viewpoints and then would go out to buy a newspaper from a media company they claim to not trust or outwardly yeah. hate and then, after purchasing it, flip through to read what their favorite creator is up to. Yeah, just open it up. Putting in my... What does a newspaper even cost these days? <laughs> Put in a fucking whole roll of quarters. Inflation. Opening up that door. Pulling the newspaper out. Uh, there's a throw that shit in the trash. <laughs> got, got the one page I'm here for. What's Dilbert up to? Oh, ho, ho, ho. I do that in the Sudoku because numbers can't lie unless they can. So, yeah, we'd, we would bet that, uh, you know, there are probably, you know, they, a lot of newspapers are now with <laughs> even this the ones latest that, news. Even the ones that got rid of it months ago. Yeah, now they're getting complaints for dropping the Dilbert comic that they actually dropped six months ago. We would, we would. That would be pretty interesting. Pretty safe bet, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's that, right? Uh, guy said some insane shit, got his comic dropped. He himself indicated years ago that he wouldn't be surprised when Dilbert bit the dust, so we're all good now, right? Uh-huh. Wrong. By God, that's culture warrior Elon Musk's music. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> yes, the chronically online owner of Twitter.com and former world's richest man decided that he needed some of that attention the Dilbert guy was yeah, getting. Yeah, hey, look, there's a live wire in the street. I'm going to touch it. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> let's see what's on the trending tab. Yeah. What's Dilbert? I remember Dilbert. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's like, there we go. Need to get some of that attention, good or bad. Got to shove my way into this argument and exclaim that um, the media is racist. 
and then follow that up with, for a very long time, US media was racist against non-white people. Now they're racist against whites and Asians. Same thing happened with elite colleges and high schools in America. Maybe they can try not being racist. You can't just fucking say that and not back it up. That is a fucking insane thing to say. Yeah, it the is... media is racist against <laughs> white people. It's insane and it's not true and is among a lot of other issues popping back up right now, a rehash of the same talking points that resulted in a Donald Trump presidency. This is the same shit that happened with like Pepe the Frog and it preys on the hopelessness and problems of a younger generation. You give them broad and easy statements to explain away why their life is hard or why they can't find partners or whatever it is. It gives them something to blame without having to reflect on themselves personally at all. It's a tried and true tactic, and this isn't new either. Then again, why the fuck would you believe anything the world's richest man has to say, especially when he was tweeting furry porn hours before his support of Dilbert? It's all chaotic and, and very frustrating. He's got people online puffing their chests out and exclaiming, maybe no one should be racist. As if we didn't just get through three years of all lives matter arguments from the very people who absolutely do not believe that to be the case. So if you need that boiled down into simpler terms, just ask yourself why the, the hell the guy who draws Dilbert is going on lengthy ranks, rants about race relations in America. Yeah, again, another thing that uh, that Larson guy and uh... The, the uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin guy, yeah. I don't know what they think about race in America, and that's good. <laughs> I believe uh, the Calvin and Hobbes guy, Bill Watson, is that his name? Uh, is actually releasing something it, new at yeah, the end of the he's year. he's got a new book coming out. Uh, and it says the media is racist, right? When you turn uh, turn the first uh, page. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with Laura Ingram on this. Uh, shut up and cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, as far as being canceled or whatever, this, this guy got millions of views on his complaint tweet where he promotes his still active podcast and promises more Dilbert than you could ever ask for over his subscription site. Put the quarters in the website this time. I need my Dilbert. So he'll be fine. Plus, he's probably got decades of desk calendar money. Yeah. Those calendars, they... They're everywhere. They'll never not sell. Mm -hmm. So let's pivot away from all that shit and throw in another wild story that has nothing to do with the United States so far. Mm -hmm. A new cryptid sighting just dropped, and this time it was confirmed by none other than the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, who posted a photo of an elusive elf-like creature based out of local folklore to his official government verified Twitter account. The translated tweet from Mexico's president reads as follows. I share two photos of our supervision of the Mayan train works. One taken by an engineer three days ago, apparently from an alux. Another by Diego Prieto of a splendid pre-Hispanic sculpture in Ekbalam. Everything is mystical. So, and a lux is like, uh, it's a Mayan elf? Yeah, I guess sort so. Sort of creature? It's like a, well, I'll describe it in a second, but it's about knee high. Okay. Uh, people don't like looking at it because it apparently causes mischief and stuff. And in some cases, they build tiny little homes for it so that it leaves them alone. Oh. Yeah. Pretty cool, though. Funny how like every culture in the world has like a folklore thing about tiny people. Yeah. What's up with that? And here in America, they just get angry at women. Yeah. 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 So I, it is. You know, it, it does look at the picture. If you look at the picture, it looks like some sort of witch. Something's or, going on there. Or evil elf or something up there in that tree. And since the president of the country tweeted it out, I mean, we should all take it very seriously. Well, he got jealous of uh, Joe Biden talking about UFOs all the time. Mexico's like, what do we got? What do we got? We got what do we elf. got? We got the elf, the elux. Uh, so first of all, the photo is a few years old. I, I <laughs> no idea why the president of Mexico decided to tweet it out now. <laughs> I mean, there there is a reason, but it's strange that he would make it seem as though this was a recent sighting. Uh, we assume that someone close to him found the photo and became he became obsessed with it. We, look, people are going to want to see this. Yeah. Also, we love cryptids. They're fun to believe in. And it's generally harmless of a pastime to be involved in unless people try to start hunting what they think are cryptids and yeah. actually harm a normal living creature that they've mistaken for a little wood elf, I guess. Just a little guy. That would be bad and also unsurprising. Don't do that. Anyways, the responses to the president have been a mixture of what? Or, sir, that's a raccoon with trash on its head. <laughs> or any number of people who are convinced that their local woodland is now and has forever been filled with Mayan elf spirits. I mean, if Mayan elf spirits did exist, I would want to stay the hell away from them because they have a lot of pretty legitimate grievances well, with uh, the, you know, the civilization that has grown uh, ar around them. As you'll I'd come say. to find out in the end of this story, 
that's the opposite of what they are getting. They are getting more people in this area, oh, and no. it's at the behest of uh, the president, who is using this as promotion for the tourism. To, like, southern Mexico? Leave that. Leave these people alone. <laughs> they, ah, come on. Anyway, yeah, the photo is old, so it's not like this is a recent sighting. But here's the backstory about the Alux, anyway. Uh, we went to the most reliable sources we can find on this one, a local resort blog that pitches a potential Alux interaction through one of their various excursions. So it's legit for sure. Here's what they have to say about this creature. If you've ever adventured through the Mayan jungle and wondered what made the trees rustle, then you may have been in the midst of Aluxes. Aluxes are small mythological creatures in the Yucatan Peninsula that are generally invisible but are able to assume physical form as resembling miniature traditionally dressed Maya people. While they are usually invisible, they can choose to appear to humans when they feel like being playful or mischievous. Aluxes are said to protect many Mayan villages and areas that still exist to this day. Legends say if you build them a small house, they will look after your land for seven years. Interested in encountering Aluxes? They usually dwell in forests, caves, grottos, or cenotes. Rumor has it that they can even be found at Tanka on our Mayan village and Tanka cenote signature tour. Cool. So yeah, this might just be uh, it might be marketing <laughs> for a tourist train that he's building in order to build more, or bring more tourism to the region. Yeah, it, that's it, uh, he's building a a train to take people to this region to explore. It is. It's yeah. So Mexico, uh, like especially the southern, southeastern parts, the jungle parts are like very cut off from the rest of the country, just like geographically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that would make sense. No, he's actually he's doing it. The posts after this were yeah. uh, like a parade float that a bunch of kids made of his train, and they're dancing hmm. as the train. Hmm. I, I just can't imagine the Mayans spirits being happy with it. Yeah, no, but yeah, the tweet, though odd, coming from someone that high up in government. Uh, seems to be harmless fun at worst, and at best is uh, honoring local folklore. Yeah. And uh, ginning up interest in uh, tourism. Why don't the we beautiful all Yucatan. take the train down to see the wonderful wood people? Yes. The wood elf people. Look, it's the ghosts of the people we massacred hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. Look at them go. But let's move over to that big Dominion lawsuit with oh, an update. <laughs> Thanks to recently unsealed court documents that indicate that Rupert Murdoch, the, the founder, the head of Fox News, was well aware that hosts on his network were peddling conspiracy theories about the legitimacy of the 2020 election. With more on these newly unsealed transcripts, here's Reuters. Fox Corps chairman Rupert Murdoch acknowledged under oath that some Fox hosts endorsed the notion that the 2020 U.S. presidential election was stolen, according to a court filing unsealed Monday. Documents in the case in Delaware State Court show Murdoch and other Fox executives believed Joe Biden fairly beat Donald Trump and that the results were not in doubt. The reporting continues. Asked by a Dominion lawyer if some of Fox's commentators had endorsed the idea that the 2020 election was stolen, Murdoch responded, yes, they endorsed, according to the filing. When questioned, Murdoch said some of Fox's commentators were endorsing the narrative of a stolen election, including maybe Lou Dobbs and maybe Maria Bartiromo. Murdoch's testimony and other material in the filing shed light on Fox's internal deliberations as it covered the election rigging claims and sought to avoid losing viewers to far right competitors that embraced Trump's false narrative. Murdoch testified that he believed early on that everything was on the up and up with the election and that he doubted claims of election fraud from the very beginning. Asked by a Dominion lawyer if he could have prevented Trump's lawyer Rudy Giuliani from continuing to spread falsehoods about the election on air, Murdoch responded, I could have. But I didn't, according to Dominion's filing. And yeah, there's been uh, a lot of interesting text messages, like uh, Fox hosts being like, "This Ru Rudy's really lost it. Rudy's off the deep end. I think he's drinking again. Yeah, there was one that indicated that uh, Sean Hannity was scared of yeah. Trump and his followers. Yeah. He's just like, I can't. I, what do you want me to do? We're going to lose all of our viewers. And then, yeah, like Tucker Carlson trying to get people like fired or reprimanded for like acknowledging that uh, the election might not have been stolen. Yeah. There was one today about a current Fox host who uh, claims that he's being reprimanded for attempting to try and cover the Dominion suit. So, who knows? Cool. What a cool but uh, while we're on the topic of updates, here's one regarding Ticketmaster and Live Nation, who have been in hot water countless times uh, over decades, and that's because of their monopolization of the live entertainment industry. But their most recent... Uh, 
problem was due to outrageous resale prices and bot attacks when tickets for an upcoming Taylor Swift tour went on sale. And we've already been over the numerous ways that Ticketmaster and Live Nation fuck you over. So let's just talk about this later, latest update and we, it just boils down to Live Nation basically saying, all right, first of all, you can't sue us over this. Second, we have a lot of really useful ideas on how to stop ticket price gouging and we can implement them right now if we wanted to, but we won't unless the government makes us. This is kind of almost a perfect, less medically and environmentally harmful version of the Norfolk Southern disaster. I mean, we could fix this, but nobody's telling us or forcing yeah. us to. Here's Gizmodo with the latest. As part of Live Nation's quarterly earnings report on Thursday, the company also announced its support for what it's calling a FAIR ticketing act. In a separate blog post, the Entertainment Goliath outlined a set of proposed legislative reforms. These include giving performers the ability to decide their own ticket resale rules, outlawing the sale of speculative tickets, i.e. scalpers that lie, expanding restrictions on automated ticket buying programs, cracking down on resale platforms, and mandating more transparent ticket pricing. Notably, these are all things that Live Nation and Ticketmaster could choose to do internally, but instead the company and its subsidiary are punting the problem to lawmakers. We already follow many of these common sense policies and are ready to make additional changes, but we can't do it alone, Live Nation wrote. We need the entire industry and policymakers to stand up for fans and artists. Gizmodo reached out to Live Nation to learn more about what internal steps the company might take to address these concerns, but didn't hear back as of publishing this. Um, very interesting. Also, like... You need... <clears throat> please regulate us. Please. Well, because they know it's going to, at the very least, take years. Yeah. So they're going to make as much well, as they possibly can until then. And it's also... Or B, never happen. Uh, so the reason regulation is uh, not only good, but vital, uh, especially in this country, is um, public companies have an obligation to their shareholders to not do anything that might cost them money unnecessarily, which is generally anything pro-consumer mm -hmm. or pro-environment, just anything that's actually good. Uh, if they do that, their shareholders are going to be like, why'd you do that? Now I'm losing money. So that's why you need the government to come in and tell them to do it. Yeah, I like how they also like slip in some stuff that wouldn't help the situation, like uh, getting aggressive with other ticket reselling sites. Like you can imagine that StubHub and SeatGeek would no longer exist. Like, just through the might of Ticketmaster. Because already, they're kind of just making things only accessible through their own resale program anyway. Yeah. Anyway, they add that the day this policy was released on their blog, it was attached to their quarterly revenue disclosures, which were a record-breaking $16.7 billion in revenue. Up 44% from the pre-pandemic benchmark of 2019. So, I think they're doing all right. Yeah, I think, I think they, they got can... some money to spare, probably. Yeah. Um... Yeah, it sounds like they could uh, not do all the bullshit they're currently doing and still uh, still do okay. But what do I know? <laughs> but finally today, if you want a taste of things to come for the world of AI hype and quarterly earnings reports... Hey, we love, we love quarterly earnings, don't we, folks? <laughs> Look no further than NVIDIA's latest earnings report, which skyrocketed their stock after they hit all the right notes in their investors' call yes. relating to AI and its products. Here's Insider. The stock surged as much as 15% in Thursday trades, adding $79 billion in value to the company's market capitalization. While the earnings beat was small, the real excitement was during the company's earnings call, in which CEO Jensen Huang said NVIDIA is working hard to capitalize on artificial intelligence as ChatGPT captures the imagination of millions of people around the world. The culmination of technology breakthroughs has brought AI to an inflection point, Huang said, adding that companies around the world are racing to incorporate the capabilities of generative language models into their businesses. The reporting continues. They add, the computing power necessary for a company to adopt in-house AI capabilities is enormous, and that's where NVIDIA's new service offering comes in. Dubbed DGX Cloud, NVIDIA is offering an AI supercomputer accessible to its customers via a web browser. The company partnered with various cloud providers, including Microsoft, Google, and Oracle, to launch the service. NVIDIA AI as a service offers enterprises easy access to the world's most advanced AI platform while remaining close to the storage, networking, security, and cloud services offered by the world's most advanced clouds, Huang explained. NVIDIA AI is essentially the operating system of AI systems today, Huang also said. So, wow, the wow. operating system of AI systems. Yeah! 
S- sign me up. Take my money, Mr. Jensen. Yeah, beat that, um, every other tech company. Ha ha. So, look, I mean, we have no doubts that AI will be the buzziest buzzword of the year, especially when it comes to big business, letting their shareholders know We're what on they're top. working on. Uh, but its actual practical uses have already uh, been here and yeah. will continue to operate behind the scenes, automating stuff that you aren't even aware of or care about. Uh, but those weird pictures and cobbled together essays, they're just, they, that's what got people jazzed. So it'll be interesting to see what remains of that or if it's just like a future of robots chatting with people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Corridor Digital's in hot water now for creating an entire uh, yeah. AI animated They're like, video. hey, look, we don't need anime artists anymore. <laughs> As if, like, it's it's a completely, like, unforced error, too. Like, there's been multiple examples just in the past few months of, like, anime fans uh, correctly uh, getting very mad at companies that uh, cut corners with AI. It is, it's not different. It is strange spe- specifically with them because their whole thing is, like, pulling the curtain back on production. Sure. And CGI and all of that stuff. So they're kind of doing that. But, yeah, they are also showing just completely how easy it is to fucking... Uh, bypass actual creatives yeah so I hate it anyways uh we, if you love ai news get ready because that's all that's happening for the foreseeable future in this world at least until next year when there's going to be a hot new buzzword that takes the industry by storm once again yeah but we will definitely i'm sure have more ai news in the very next episode of this show because it is tech news day coming up but in the meantime we have plenty more for you to watch and hey this, this episode, it wasn't sponsored, which means you, if you want to support the show, you can do so very easily by hitting the thank button or becoming a member of the channel by clicking the join button. There's a Patreon link down there too if you're nasty. Uh, if you consume hours of our episodes every month, why not give us five bucks? There's even a little verified emoji that lets everyone know that you're just as special as that guy on Twitter. Yeah. So, uh, of course, just leaving a like or a comment is more than enough to make us happy. So leave a like and a comment, damn it. Please. All right, now... There's the videos on screen for you to watch. We've got Evil Cookie Monster. We've got Trump throwing water bottles. Check those bad boys out and stay tuned for another episode coming soon. Bye. Bye.